The Norman and Florence Brody Family Foundation is dedicated to exploring topics of national and international importance and is proud to support Policy Watch with Doug Besheroff at the University of Maryland. From the University of Maryland, this is Policy Watch with Doug Besheroff. For many Americans, staying home with the kids is no longer an option. As the percentage of single parents rises, the need for affordable child care is increasing. What does this trend mean for the future of our nation's child care providers? To find out, Policy Watch is joined by Dr. T. Barry Brazelton, a leading expert on pediatrics and child development. And now, the host of Policy Watch, Doug Besherov. T. Barry Brazelton. Welcome to the University of Maryland again, and to Policy Watch. Thank you. Wonderful to have you back. Well, I admire what you're doing. Well, thanks. I read that you wanted to be a pediatrician from the time you were nine years old. Is that right? Mm -hmm. How did that happen? Well, I hated my younger brother. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> I, I hated him so much that I thought I ought to make up for it somewhere else. and. Uh, my grandmother, whom I adored and who loved me best, um, <laughs> used to get, make me take care of all of my uh, cousins. I had eight cousins that I had to take care of always at family gatherings. And she would say, Barry, you're so good with small children. I still hear her voice all the time. Grandparents are so important to children. Oh, that was exactly our experience as well. So your focus has been on the child and on parent attachment, infant and parental behavior, across cultures, actually. Um, and we'll talk a little later about intervention with at-risk um, infants and parents. But I want to talk for a little bit about your understanding of the nature versus nurture, or what I think you'd call the nature plus nurture debate. Um, and I think you called it once a developmental duet. Absolutely. I don't think you can divide them up. I think it's absolutely absurd to do that. If you think about what a baby after at birth has been through nine months of exposure to all sorts of things, including how the mother walks, how she thinks, how much anxiety she has, all of these things are affecting the fetus now we know and my newborn assessment picks them out. <laughs> well, I read also that you, you ask some of your um, expectant mother patients to keep a time diary for 24 hours. Yeah. And then you tell them what their um, baby or fetus was experiencing do, during that time. They tell me. Tell me. Tell us about They that. tell me how the baby goes from sleep to awake, sleep to awake every three to four hours in utero, and they know exactly when that baby's going to fall apart at the end of the day and start kicking. And they also know, even know how to postpone that by not eating or by having going out at night or something like that. So they know all about this fetus by the time it comes. They are so in tune with it. What, what change, if any, has been caused by sonograms? Because they're now these fabulous three-dimensional color. Well, I think they can be frightening, and they can be, they aren't as reliable as we wish they were so far. They can also be re very reinforcing. I think when you see a newborn a baby about to happen uh, and see that it responds to light and to sound, we have done some experiments showing that the baby not only responds to sound and light, but it, to a negative one, it shuts it out. To a positive one, it turns to it as a newborn. Isn't that fascinating? That really is. That really is. So the mother knows all that. But your theory, and you've started a program called Touch Points, your theory is that we should do more to join parents as allies in this system of child development. Um, if I can, let me ask you how they're not before <laughs> Touch Points, and they're not allies, how we apply a more deficit 
orientation and how your program touch points tries to make a, take a more positive view and model for parent-child relations. Well, I think parents are having a very tough time, as I said, and I think some things that they are having to give up are very frightening to them. Time with their children. That every parent I've ever seen who has to work outside the home suffers, male and female. And so they not only feel guilty, they feel cheated. And uh, the other thing that I find really tough is that it's very hard for them to push the child to learn limits. What I mean by discipline. Discipline is teaching, not punishment. Mm -hmm. And so parents need to work at that. It's a long-term process. And parents who work outside the home um, find it very hard to come home at the end of the day and say, no, you cannot do that. And I have to stop you every time until you learn to stop yourself. That's the goal for discipline. And it's very hard for them. So kids, I think, are growing up really acting out a lot in a way that scares them, scares their parents, scares society. So we need to back up parents for how important discipline is. Discipline second to love comes very close to it. And also for the younger children when, when the parents come home, some, those children have had a busy, as busy a day as the parents. They're sometimes quite tired. And you hear stories about the parents who say, all right, this is the time for quality time. Let's, let's play. When a child just wants a little quiet time. Is that right? Do you see that? Yeah, that's why the rocking chair. <laughs> that's why you need something that everybody can relax in together and communicate in the process. You know, communicate that I've had a tough day, you've had a tough day. Now we can get to be, we can fall in love again. Tell us a little bit about touch points. Is it a program or an idea? Well, it's more of an idea than a program. We try to train people to, uh, from other disciplines to use it in the way they look at parents and children and help bring parents together and feel part of a team to give that child a future. Touch points are, in my way of thinking, uh, times just before a child takes a spurt in development, either cognitive or motor or emotional and just before a spurt there's a period when the child falls apart and the parent falls apart with them mm -hmm. and if I'm there to touch into the system and say but look regression is a time for reorganization they they don't fall apart parent feels oh and then even though the child isn't eating or sleeping they can put off worrying about that and the child will take off and they say I knew what I was doing. There's six of these in the first year, four or five each year after that. And um, Now, wait a minute. Six in the first year means there's a lot of change happening very rapidly. Is that Everybody thinks change goes like that, doesn't it? It goes burst, leveling off, burst, leveling off. And just before each burst, there's a period of regression. The child won't eat, won't sleep starts sucking his thumb again, starts wetting the bed again, starts lying, stealing. Parents go crazy with these things if you aren't there to help them understand that these are a necessary part of development. Now what you're saying seems to me not only golden and correct, and this is as we've talked before, this is the positive view as opposed to the deficit view. Good. You've got it. Well, the reason I don't have it that well is because when I go to so many of the public agencies that are assigned to helping, especially the most disadvantaged families, I don't see anything of what you're talking about. Now, you know, the, the, there are three things that we've found are magical in reaching out to stressed parents, and I think all parents are stressed, but particularly underserved populations. We've, we work in Harlem, we have two sites, we have eight North, North American Indian sites, and we have 72 sites around the country 
where the whole community changes to pay attention to parents and children. Now, the one in, Har in Harlem is called Harlem Children's Zone. Mm -hmm. We work with Je Jeffrey Canada there. Tell us a little bit more about that. It's wonderful. Uh, well, we work with new parents, and these young, young parents come in, and we help them evaluate their baby, and they begin to ask us questions that, you know, you think, my gosh, think of the passion that these people have who are going through a lot more than any of us can even contemplate in the way of poverty and hopelessness and all the rest. And the second you concentrate on their baby, their eyes get like this, their whole faces catch fire, and they've got just as much passion as any of us have. Why the hell don't we pay attention to it and give, it, give them the kind of backup they need to keep that passion alive in an environment that's really tough? And we can do it. We have done it. And they start asking us questions that are just so perceptive and so... And what they do is if they catch fire, like I to say, they look at their baby and they say, that was wonderful. And the baby begins to catch fire. And these kids have so much self-esteem that they're going to have a different future. I visited a program for it drug-exposed children and their mothers. And the mothers had all sorts of problems, but truth be told, they were not great taking care of their newborns. But the program would show them things to do and just start the ball rolling. And the one I remember most was they would tell the mothers, smile while you're changing the diaper. The mothers, I guess, had never thought of that or whatever. They smiled at the baby, and of course the baby naturally responded with a smile, and diaper changing became a positive experience, not a battle between parent and child. Absolutely. It was quite beautiful. It is. And I, for the 20 years since I saw that, I wondered how we could institutionalize that. You know, the best way is modeling and not telling. Top, which I call top down, but just uh, you know, when the mother is about to diaper a baby, say you know, let's let's talk to that baby together. And the mother looks at you and you say, "How are you doing?" And the baby goes, "Ooh," and the and the mother leans over and she says, "Ooh," and the baby looks back at her, and that mother never forgets it. <laughs> and you can do that with feeding. You can do it with every every kind of interaction and if you model it rather than telling people pick it up they're just ready for it let me go through a little list here this is called a paradigm shift and this is how you describe what should be the difference and we've talked about going from a deficit model to a positive model but the next one is linear development going from that to multi-dimensional development what do you mean by that well, this jagged way of learning, fortunately, because it's such a costly model of learning, uh, motor, cognitive, emotional learning sort of parallel each other, but they don't happen at the same time. And so each one takes its own energy and puts it together. And if a parent can see that and see that at four and a half months, for instance, no baby will stay at the breast or stay at the bottle. If anything is happening around, they will No, no, that's just my baby. That's just my baby who doesn't pay attention. That's right. And so if a mother understands that that baby's having more fun looking and listening than they would eating, then when you say, why don't you feed her in a dark, quiet room twice a day? That'll keep your milk going. And then let her play at each of the other feedings. Mother's just, oh my gosh, you've given them a gift, like, like a, a piece of, of diamond. And yet it must be a very fine line between prescriptive and collaborative approaches. It sure is. It means you don't tell, you listen. In all of our sites where 
this is a successful program, the amount of words that the professional uses goes down like that and the parent's words go up. Isn't that interesting? We'd love to tell people what to do. <laughs> and when you do, what you're saying is, I know, but you don't. Mm -hmm. I don't believe that. Uh, objective involvement versus empathetic involvement. Same thing. Um, and then strict discipline boundaries versus flexible discipline boundaries. Well, I don't think anybody can do for parents what they need alone anymore. I think it has to be a team. And if the team can work together, it's, it's so important. I, I ask a professional, for instance, to put down what he needs to, to get his pay from the insurance company and then write one sentence about the mother and one sentence about the father. Uh, mother looked so pretty in her red dress. Father was leaning forward the whole time the child was doing something. And when the child did it, he did, almost startled, he got so excited. And then about the child, what he was like. And then the next person that sees that child will say, oh, Miss so-and-so saw you last time, and she said you looked so pretty in your red dress. That mother will say, my God, somebody paid attention. And then turn to the father and say, and she said you were so involved with that little boy that everything he did was exciting to you. That father's in your pocket from then on. And the, the baby, you can say, he was so active. Everybody said, oh, he ought to be on Ritalin. But you know, he was just like this. How's he doing? Those parents never forget to come in on time. They come on time. They come in for every visit. It's a whole other world. But it's a very difficult world to achieve. I'm not meaning to get... But what you're describing is something where someone has to sit down with mother, father, child, and maybe other relatives. And it doesn't look as if there's space for that in our public schools right now. Well, you know, I'm not sure. I think we all hide behind time these days, and I'm not sure it's time. I think it's more involvement, letting yourself dare to get involved. And we found in child care and in, in schools, this same competition that interferes with people talking to each other. Our schools have shoved parents out of it, and they've got to get back in. We need them. And uh, the same thing in medicine. We've shoved parents out, and we need to pull them back in. We can do it. This is a big challenge. Um, it's working, though, in these 72 sites. When you're in these 72 sites, Is there initial hostility or are people, because they've asked you in, is this something that's very positive to the providers already? We don't take people unless they're passionate for change. If they are ready for change, we're willing to take them and train them to think this way because it's really just a way of thinking. And uh, if they're ready for change, they're ready to give up on time and you know whether or not you dare make this kind of relationship and makes a big difference. Now, uh, let's talk for a few minutes about other forms of institutional change. But let's go to the divorce and child custody for a second, because what I see there is the courts not res respecting a child's need for stability and continuity. Uh, I was involved in a case where a court ruled that the non-custodial father had a right to come visit the child on Christmas Day and that the child had to spend 90 minutes, not 85 minutes, not 100, 90 minutes with the father someplace in the house while the rest of the family is doing Christmas. And I said, what was this judge thinking? You know, I've talked to the judges, the family court judges, and they're just as disturbed as we are <laughs> about how little they ha have to make decisions about. I think this is a good example of ne needing a multidisciplinary group to work around each child. 
and we just haven't committed that kind of uh, opportunity. Judges are ready for it. Mm -hmm. It's not their fault. <laughs> it's, it's really the lack of backup for them. And I think we need to do that if we're going to protect children from the effects of divorce. They're the ones that really pay the price. Yeah. Now, I know you want every family to get help, but there are some families that need more help. They're underserved, to use your phrase. Beyond touch points, what, what service, you just said a multidisciplinary team in divorce for judges, what service would you like to see created for those underserved families? Well, you, you hit me where, where I'm too prejudiced to answer. I want them to have the kind of caring uh, touch points approach of respecting what they have to bring. You want me to give you an example? I, I, I'd like to know whether you want the, let, let's take an example, a teen mother. I, I want to know when you want the teen mother. I want, I, if you'll tell us, what kind of program supports you'd like her to have like for her to have somebody who really respected her, who treated her as if she were uh, an important person, and if her mother's there, that her, that two of them are a team that deserve your respect, and so forth. Do we have many of those programs around? Not enough. We need to. Well, you've gone to Congress and sometimes asked for these kinds of programs. Um, because I've so enjoyed learning about your experiences and testifying. What's, tell us about your experiences going to Congress and asking for expansions in whether it's child care or these other services for underserved families. Well, I haven't been recently because I just find it too... You swore scary. off going. I thought, you, I thought I heard you say you're not going again. Well, I would if I thought there was a climate for it. I, I don't find there is right now. But um, I used to go down a lot and to testify for parental leave and for uh, early intervention and for child care. And they would always follow me with um, an intact, perfect family that would say, if the government does this, you take away our rights as a family. And I thought, what rights do most people have that they can depend on? And that we need to give everybody this chance, not just these few little perfect families. So um, it's been discouraging, but I think we've all got to do it. We've got to fight for what we need. Um, there have been many child advocates um, uh, in this field. they've tended to talk about children. We've tended to talk about parents and children. Um, would it make a difference if we talked about parents and children? Well, Winnicott said there's never a baby without a mother, without a, and I would say without a family today. And so unless we think about the whole family, I don't think we're really doing a lot for children and the programs that wait until families aren't available any longer. And I, you know, I have a prejudice that it's the first few years when par parents are so hungry for whatever we offer them that there is change available. So uh, I would think that m our resources ought to go in way back in here when brain development is going on like that and then slopes down like that. And whatever we create back here in the way of self-esteem, a feeling of respect, and of giving that child a feeling that every time I do something wonderful, somebody's going to say, you are great. And if we can do that early on and give parents the, you know, the steps to, for doing it, we can create a, a different kind of outcome. I want to make a small point here. I'm struck that when I asked you about a service for teen mothers, you mentioned the grandparents. And uh, my impression is that very few programs actively try to engage grandparents in these kinds of situations. And um, that's too bad. 
It is too bad. There was one wonderful program in uh, Berkeley by a woman named Vera Casey in which she had a daycare center right across from the high school mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so these girls could go back and get their GED. But then she did the innovative thing. She got male and females from the high school. It became part of their curriculum that they had to come over and diaper a baby, feed the baby, watch that baby learn to do something. And if the, that was all part of their training. And recidivism just went down like that. Every, the, and these kids would say, I didn't know this was a person. <laughs> so. You know, there are a lot of innovative things like that we can do. I keep thinking there is a lifetime of additional education that we have to provide to the parents, to the politicians, right, and to the professionals. You and I got to do it. We've all got to do it. <laughs> Barry Brazelton, thank you very much. This program was produced by the University of Maryland, which is solely responsible for its content. The Norman and Florence Brody Family Foundation is dedicated to exploring topics of national and international importance and is proud to support Policy Watch with Doug Besheroff at the University of Maryland.